We're going to get started. Recording. All right. <coughs> so we're now getting into... We're getting into uh, carbohydrates, your sugars, uh, the other more, uh, the other important uh, biomolecule. We finished talking about proteins. So these are carbohydrates, and uh, I know chapter eight, I don't know how far into chapter eight he's gotten, but that's uh, lipids. Uh, uh, but carbohydrates and lipids, it turns out, isn't as bad as it looks. So we're gonna go through a couple things. So, so, uh, definition of a carbohydrate, I just consider it as sugars, and uh, simple sugars are, uh, are, you see this term here, this vocab term, uh, monosaccharides. It's made of at least one uh, component uh, sugar, of which you need to know one, two, three, five, six, I can't remember the number, but we'll go over the different monosaccharides you have to know today. Uh, there's other vocabulary terms here. Oligosaccharide is just a few monosaccharides put together. Polysaccharide is a very long polymer of monosaccharides. Blah, 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 blah. I'm sure you guys could uh, study the definitions all you want. Uh, some things that aren't as easy as, as those vocabulary terms are phrases like aldoses and ketoses and, and furanos and pyranos and all those different things, right? So today we'll go over what each of those mean in context of each of the different uh, monosaccharides. Uh, but to simplify, uh, to begin with, uh, and it, whenever you see the phrase aldose, it means that the particular sugar you are talking about uh, contains an aldehyde. Uh, meanwhile, if it is a ketose, it contains a ketone. So it's pretty easy to memorize what aldose means and what ketose means, because it's in the name. Aldose contains an aldehyde and ketose uh, contains a ketone. Um, you used to have to memorize this stuff, so I'll, I'll give you the information, and it is still somewhere in the worksheet sometimes, but uh, you do sometimes have to memorize the fact that the simplest aldose, the shortest aldose that you can possibly have, is called glyceraldehyde. Don't worry about what it looks like, or you know what hydrogen is where, what carbon is where, just that the simplest, shortest aldose is glyceraldehyde, and the simplest, shortest ketose, listed right here also, dihydroxyacetone, okay? Of course, the actual monosaccharides you guys are going to need for the exam are way longer than this. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they're either five carbons long or six carbons long, so we'll spend more of our time studying that. Uh, oh yeah, you guys now know that amino acids are what configuration? Amino acids are what configuration? L configuration. Uh, carbohydrates are more often D configuration, but it isn't, uh, it isn't like a 100% rule like it was for amino acids. For amino acids, all naturally occurring amino acids were L, were L configuration. For sugars, a huge majority is D configuration, but some of them can be L configuration. You don't have to memorize which ones prefer which. Uh, just go in knowing that D configuration is the overwhelmingly preferred co uh, configuration for sugars, for carbohydrates. Uh, yeah, you don't have to memorize the linear version of monosaccharides. You don't have to memorize most of this stuff on here, so don't bother. Uh, if you don't attend class, you might think you have to. So I'm going to skip down to the parts that matter. You don't have to memorize stuff about, uh, you know, these num uh, the, the D, L configuration, stereo center, organic chemistry nonsense. You don't have to worry about that here. Uh, man, there's a lot of preamble here. Okay. Um, oh, other vocabulary terms before we start drawing things uh, is the phrase pyranos and furanos form. Okay. Uh, whenever you see the phrase, and this is my shortcut for this, uh, Pyrenos and Pyrenos form both describe a cyclic configuration of something. My shortcut is, if something is the Pyrenos form, it's a five-membered ring. Pyrenos is the other one, six-membered ring, okay? So Pyrenos, if a sugar, and we're going to find out which ones prefer the Pyrenos form, if a sugar, if a monosaccharide prefers the furanose form, it is a five-membered ring. Pyranose is the only other one you have to worry about. It's six-membered ring. And we will see examples in a second. And note that aldohexoses prefer it. 
You will see why in a little bit. And keto hex uh, prefer pyranose and keto hexoses prefer furanoses. Okay, so instead of going with this, I'm going to draw things. One of the most important things in chapter 10 is recognizing the structure of the, mon of the important monosaccharides. Because you might get questions about, oh, you modify carbon-6 on this sugar, what is it now? Uh, or you have one monosaccharide, it's asking for what is the diastereomer of this monosaccharide, or epimer of this monosaccharide, and we'll do a couple examples in a second. But in order to answer any of that, we have to know what they look like. So we will start with the most common, most important monosaccharide of all time, glucose. Okay? So here's what glucose looks like. This is the only one that I think you really just need to straight up memorize if you, if you haven't memorized it yet. This is what glucose looks like. And again, you only need to know the cyclic form for the exam. Ooh. And I'll explain the squiggly line in a little bit. But here's glucose. It's a six-membered ring. So is this a furanose or a pyranose? Pyranose, so oh, all right. Feature number one of glucose is it's a pyranose. Okay. Uh, how many carbons are in glucose? Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Note that this is an oxygen, be careful of that. This one up here in the top right corner is an oxygen part of the ring. But you count up the number of carbons, there are six carbons. So other vocab words we can use to describe glucose is it's a hexose. Six carbons. Note that just because something is a six-membered ring does not automatically mean that it is a six-carbon structure. And if something is a six-carbon structure, it does not automatically mean it's going to be part of a six-membered ring. Uh, so that's why I split up these two things. They mean two different things. Uh, you can't really see it in this illustration, but if I were to tell you that the linear form of glucose has an aldehyde in it, what other word could I use to describe glucose? Aldose, exactly. Okay. These are all the vocabulary words you would use to describe uh, glucose up to this point. All right. Ways to memorize glucose structure. It is a six-membered ring. Look at how I've drawn my functional groups. Up, down, up, down. It's an alternating pattern. Glucose should be one of the easier ones to identify if you're given the structure on the exam because these functional groups are alternating up, down, up, down. It, and just because this one's pointing up doesn't mean that's the only way it could be shown. If CH2OH was pointing down instead, then this would be pointing up, this would be pointing down, this would be pointing up. Like, you, you, get, you don't memorize it specifically just exactly I have drawn here. If we flip it upside down, it is still glucose, is all I'm saying, okay? So the, the real feature that makes this glucose is this alternating pattern we have here. That's the real feature. Uh, the import, the uh, weird thing, though, is what happens at this carbon right here. Uh, I've drawn a squiggly line there. Uh, that, is that is used to indicate that this OH can either be pointing up or down, and it would still be called glucose either way. We would just change the name a little bit, and we'll go over that in a second. So whenever you see any drawing, and you see this in the PowerPoints, I, I know for sure, uh, where they draw a squiggly line functional group there. They're just trying to tell you that, that functional group can rotate pointing up or down or whatever And it will not change the name of that sugar Okay, so why do they uh, well, what is so special about this spot here? This is what is called a free anomeric carbon Okay, And let's explain that So this spot here that that functional group is attached to is a free anomeric carbon. It's the only free anomeric carbon in this entire picture. So what is a free anomeric carbon? Well, first, what is an anomeric carbon? My overly simplified definition of an anomeric carbon is one bonded, is a carbon bonded to two oxygens. It's the only carbon in the entire picture 
that is bonded to two oxygens. The really technical definition is it's bonded to two heteroatoms, but the only ones you, got, you guys ever worry about are like oxygen, phos uh, phosphorus, and, and sulfur, and nitrogen. But here, the most common example of, of heteroatoms uh, are oxygen, so I simplify the definition to anomeric carbon is the one bonded to two oxygens. Now, what is a free anomeric carbon? is the fact that this functional group here is a hydroxyl group, okay? So first, you have to figure out which one is the anomeric carbon, and I'll explain uh, the free part again in a second. First, you have to figure out which one is the anomeric carbon. It is simply the one bonded to two oxygens. Notice no other carbon in here is bonded to two oxygens simultaneously. After that, you determine it's a free anomeric carbon if the functional group here is a hydroxyl. If it is anything else, like OCH3 or OR group or O anything else, it is just an anomeric carbon, not a free anomeric carbon, okay? So the free part is the OH that is there. That one, so, so again, you need to find both of these properties to determine if, if something is a free anomeric carbon. I'll explain why that's such a big deal, but first you have to identify it. Again, carbon bonded to two oxygens, that's an anomeric carbon. It is free if this group here is a hydroxyl group. If it is literally anything else, like OCH3 or OR group or O bonded to something else, it is not a free anomeric carbon. So a free anomeric carbon is the special carbon on any monosaccharide or disaccharide or polysaccharide whose functional group is allowed to rotate. If you look in your notes or practice exams sometimes, you see the phrase muta rotation. Muta rotation. It's just a way of saying that that functional group can rotate up, down, uh, in whatever orientation. It, it does not change the name of the sugar. Okay, so a free anomeric carbon means that that functional group is allowed to, to undergo muta rotation. It also means that that uh, uh, hydrogen here, or that, that functional group here, can be reduced. It, it, no, let me, let me write this down first, and then I'll explain it. It means that that monosaccharide is a reducing sugar. Okay, which if you go back in Gen Chem 2, you learn about oxidation, reduction, blah, blah, blah. Don't worry about the specific details in this class, just vocab words. If something has a free anomeric carbon, no matter what sugar it is, it means that it is a reducing sugar. Uh, let me see other vocab words that are important here. Uh, oh yeah. The name of the sugar will still be glucose. The only difference between a glucose whose anomeric carbon is pointing up versus a glucose whose anomeric carbon is pointing down, well, let me draw the rest of it real quick. Okay, the only difference between them is that one is going to be labeled alpha glucose and the other one is going to be labeled beta glucose. Uh, here's my way of, of memorizing which one is alpha and which one is beta. You look at the anomeric carbon functional group, so OH, and in this case you see that it's pointing down, right? Compare the orientation of this functional group here on the right with this functional group at the very end, your CH2OH. If they are pointing in opposite directions, if your anomeric carbon thing is pointing in opposite directions with the CH2OH, this is anti to each other, which you can memorize means alpha. So this is alpha glucose. Alpha glucose is when the anomeric carbon functional group is pointing in the exact opposite direction that the CH2OH is pointing. The anomeric carbon functional group is pointing down, the CH2OH functional group is pointing up. Uh, for comparison's sake and process of elimination, the one on the left here must be beta glucose. So just for illustrative purposes, let's see. The functional group over here on the glucose on the left, the, the, at, at the anomeric carbon is pointing up, for CH2OH, it is also pointing up. When they're pointing in the same direction, I don't have a shortcut of memorizing this one. When they're pointing in the same direction, it is beta glucose. 
okay? So alpha glucose is when they're pointing anti to each other. Beta glucose is when they're pointing in the same direction to each other. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else? Anomeric carbons, reducing sugars, mutual rotation, alpha versus beta. Okay. Uh, there's other bits of information uh, that we'll go over in detail in a little bit, but to start with, these are the most basic pieces of information for each monosaccharide that you should look at. Figure out, is it a pyranose form? Is it hexose or pentose? Is it aldose or ketose? Uh, know what it'll look like. Uh, be able to identify which carbon in the picture is your anomeric carbon and then figure out if it's a free anomeric carbon or not. Uh, if it is a free anomeric carbon, you can automatically put a check mark next to these two, voca uh, these two vocabulary terms. Uh, if it's a free anomeric carbon, it means it can undergo muta rotation, and it means that the sugar is a reducing sugar. Uh, and finally, uh, if they really specifically uh, draw out the anomeric carbon functional group, figure out if it's an alpha, alpha conformation or beta conformation, uh, alpha anomer or beta anomer, okay? All right, we're going to do a couple more examples of this, so don't worry if you haven't uh, internalized all this yet. There's still a bunch of other monosaccharides to cover. All right. Uh, the next one, uh, he gives you, the next three, he gives you a bit of an acronym to help you memorize the next three monosaccharides. Galloman, right? And Galloman stands for galactose, aloes, and mannose. Okay? And the reason why these three specifically are talked about is because they're going to look extremely similar to glucose. They're going to be different at exactly one spot, and we'll see in a second. So let me draw the base skeleton of all three of these things. Oh yeah, now let me put glucose up here in the top corner so that you guys can compare these things to glucose. Okay. Uh, or you could flip over to your previous page to see what glucose looks like. So it turns out galactose is going to look almost the exact same thing as glucose, except for one difference. <coughs> which I will tell you in a second. Aloes, it turns out, is going to look exactly the same as glucose, except for one difference. And mannose is gonna look the exact same, it's gonna look exactly the same as glucose, except for one difference. And you may spot that difference. For galactose, this functional group is pointing up, but over on glucose, it was pointing down. Everything else in this structure for galactose would look exactly the same as glucose. The only difference is this carbon here on the left. For aloes, the only difference it has compared to glucose is that one. And for mannose, the only difference it has compared to glucose is that one. They're in the opposite, they're pointing in the opposite direction to where it, it should be pointing in glucose, okay? So once you memorize glucose, memorizing these becomes 10 times easier because it's literally the exact same thing as glucose, you just make sure one of the carbons is flipped the wrong way, okay? So for galactose, that's the carbon that's pointing in the wrong direction. For aloes, it's that one. For mannose, it's that one. It goes like left to right. That's kind of what, that's why he gives you the acronym in that order. All three of these things are in a six-membered ring, so they are all what? Pyranoses, good. They're all in the same tree as glucose, so they all um, were made from, uh, they all had an aldehyde group uh, in their linear form, so these are all aldoses as well. All three of them are pyranoses, all three of them are aldoses. They all have six carbons in them, so they are all hexoses as well. Okay, so they have the same terms associated with them that, that glucose had. 
The only difference is which carbons are pointing in, in, in the wrong direction. Now, remember in organic chemistry one or two where you learned about terms like enantiomers, diastereomers, and in this class there's epimers and anomers, right? So here's a uh, quick breakdown of how those terms relate to uh, monosaccharides. We'll start with enantiomers because this is the least likely thing you will see an example of in this class. The reason why is an enantiomer of D-glucose, an enantiomer of it is L-glucose, which you will not see drawn uh, on the exam. So just voc vocab-wise, what an enantiomer is in this context is the difference between a configuration of, of D versus L. That is, uh, these are enantiomers of each other, D-glucose versus L-glucose. In organic chemistry, you learn that what this means is that all of your chiral centers are flipped the other way around between these two things. But in this class, what that means is the difference between D versus L configuration. The more important term for this class is diastereomers. Diastereomers are when you compare two uh, monosaccharides to each other and they differ at at least one chiral center. Okay, which in this context is how the functional groups are pointing. Are they pointing ups or downs in relation to each other? So let's compare galactose and glucose to each other. They look almost exactly the same except they differ at exactly one spot here. So they are diastereomers of each other. Glucose and galactose are diastereomers of each other because they differ at at least one chiral center. One of these functional groups are pointing in the wrong direction. Galactose and aloes differ at two different chiral centers, right? Right there. They differ at two places. That still fits the definition of diastereomers. Galactose and aloes are diastereomers of each other, okay? So in terms of vocab, that's what we mean by diastereomers in this class. Now we get to some really specific vocab terms that apply only in certain situations so that we cover all our bases, and that is the phrase epimer. Epimer is a diastereomer that differs at only one chiral center, okay? So it is a very specific diastereomer. An epimer is a very specific diastereomer. It is one that differs, when you, when you have two molecules compared to each other, it is one that differs at only one chiral center. So, back to our example up here, galactose and glucose are epimers of each other, but, is, but are galactose and aloes epimers of each other? No, galactose and aloes are diastereomers of each other because they differ at two places. But they wouldn't be epimers because the definition of epimer is you need to only be different at one spot, okay? The very last annoying term is anomer, which we've been introduced a little bit already. An anomer is a specific epimer that differs only at the anomeric carbon. So it gets more and more specific. So epimer was a specific diastereomer that differs at only one chiral center, and anomer is a specific epimer that differs only at the anomeric carbon. Okay, and I won't go over examples of, of anomers. We've already done the alpha anomer of glucose and the beta anomer of glucose, but now you know these terms. All right? Okay. Uh, let me flip to make sure I've covered everything I wanted to regarding monosaccharides. Because we'll have to go fast today. All right, a few more pieces of information. All right. Oh yeah, I have to go over the other two. Uh, okay, 
Annoying. Let's see. I sometimes forget to cover these two. There's two more monosaccharides you have to know about. One is ribose, and the other is fructose, which are going to look very similar to each other, but they are very different from each other. So both of these prefer the five-membered ring. Okay, so let me draw out a five-membered ring. All right, both of these prefer the five-membered ring. The only difference And I might have this last one backwards, my bad, but uh, here's how you quickly tell the difference between ribose and fructose. First, in order to tell that it is either ribose or fructose, is the fact that they fit a five-membered ring, which what word do we use to describe a five-membered ring? Furanose, right? So they're both furanose. However, ribose only has five carbons in it, so it is a pentose. And fructose has six carbons in it, so it is a hexose. Okay. Ribose, uh, when you look at its linear form, has an aldehyde in it, so it is an aldose. Meanwhile, fructose is the only monosaccharide you have to know that has a ketone in its linear form. So what do we use to describe fructose then? Ketose, exactly. This is the only ketose you have to know is fructose. All right. Uh, so, to break down their structures, five-membered ring, here's the CH2OH, just like uh, glucose had, and uh, for ribose, another kind of quick way to memorize it is that these two OHs over here should be pointing in the same direction. But fructose, they're always pointing in opposite directions. So come up with whatever shortcut you want to memorize these structures. Uh, there's, there's plenty to choose from. Uh, let's go over some other things that we needed to figure out from here, such as where is the anomeric carbon, which uh, the definition I gave is that an anomeric carbon is one bonded to what? Two oxygens, right? So that's this one right here. And that's this one right here. It, uh, just because I always draw the anomeric carbon near the right side of the picture doesn't automatically mean the anomeric carbon is always going to show up on the right side. Uh, believe me, that is a common mistake people make. They always think that the furthest right carbon must be the anomeric carbon. No. The definition, again, is one and bonded to two oxygens. Okay, so these are anomeric carbons. Are they free, uh, one at a time, is ribose a free anomeric, it has, does it have a free anomeric carbon? Yeah. Yes, because it's an OH, not O something else. Fructose, free anomeric carbon. Uh, and again, it, it, the answer is technically yes, because the only thing we want to look at is the hydroxyl group, as long as that is OH and not OCH3 or OR group or O whatever, as long as it is OH, it is a free anomeric carbon. It does not matter what the other uh, functional group looks like. It is specifically the one with the oxygen here. Is it OH? Then it's a free anomeric carbon. Is it O something else? It is not a free anomeric carbon. Uh, okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, Because I'm not good at drawing chair conformation or whatever, I'm only I'm going to go with the picture they have in the diagram here. So what you are looking at, what you are looking at, is a uh, picture of glucose. Uh, it is actually a picture of uh, beta glucose. 
It turns out beta-glucose is the more stable anomer of glucose because in beta-glucose, and you know what, I'll go ahead and flip back to the picture so you can see what it looks like not in the chair conformation. If you look at uh, beta-glucose down here, what do you notice about its functional groups? Let's see, up, down, up, down, up. You see that it's alternating, right? Whenever you have any type of cyclic structure whose all of their functional groups are perfectly alternating, up, down, up, down, up, that is going to mean that all your functional groups will be equatorial, which is an organic chemistry term. It's not as important in this class, uh, so I'm not going to cover what equatorial versus axial means. But basically, if your functional groups are alternating, it means everything is equatorial, which biologically or biochemically means it is the more stable, the most stable form of that sugar that you could possibly have, is when all your functional groups are alternating with each other. So beta glucose is very stable because everything is equatorial. Which you can only get if, if all the functional groups are alternating direction. Compare that to alpha glucose where you have up, down, up, down, down. This is close but not exactly right. So this one is not as stable as beta glucose. Uh, which is a, a little bit of a fact that uh, if you're more versed in organic chemistry, you would notice right away. For this class, just if you have to, just memorize the fact that beta glucose is more stable because the functional groups are alternating. Okay. Uh, other, um, other little bits of facts and information you'll need, I'll give you in a second. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Again, more stuff I'm not going to draw, but all you will need to know about this slide. So what, what this slide and slides after this talk about are monosaccharide derivatives. What that means is any of the monosaccharides, you can modify it slightly and it will have slightly different properties. In this example, this is what all the, these are the three possible uh, fates that a monosaccharide can undergo if it is being oxidized. If it is specifically a monosaccharide is being oxidized at carbon one, the suffix changes into O-N-I-C. So for example, if the question says, glucose is oxidized at carbon one, it, what would it be called? Which of the following answer choices would, would, would you pick? And the answer would be gluconic uh, acid, right? If it was, uh, oh yeah, by the way, I guess I should have started with that. These are all uh, acidic sugars. If you oxidize glucose at carbon-6, what would the name become? It'd become glucuronic acid, okay? And if the problem asks you if glucose is oxidized at both carbon-1 and carbon-6, what would it be called now? It'd be called glucaric acid. Do not worry about having to identify what any of them look like on the exam. It would be given to you in a word problem format where they give you a sugar and they tell you it's oxidized at either carbon one, carbon six, or both carbon one and carbon six. And you're supposed to report back what the name of the sugar will be. So uh, how about what would be the name uh, of the sugar if uh, galactose was oxidized at carbon six? Galacturonic acid. It's as simple as that. Like, don't, don't worry about overthinking anything. It is, for this uh, section of the notes, that's all you need to know. Okay. You already did Galliman. So, other than oxidized sugars, there's a, bunch of, there's a whole bunch of different uh, sugar derivatives. And if you aren't attending class, you might think you have to memorize all of these things. You don't. You just need to know the specific categories of sugar derivatives, which are listed here. Monosaccharides can be turned into sugar alcohols, deoxy sugars, sugar esters, amino sugars, and we've already gone over these, acetyls, ketols, uh, those are the, the cyclic forms of sugars. Uh, so they give you different picture examples of those sugar derivatives, but don't bother memorizing uh, really any of them. All, all a, all a, uh, th this is an example of sugar alcohols, by the way. All a sugar alcohol is, is that the, um, 
the oxidized functional group at the end of a sugar is just reduced. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. It's a fancy way of saying there's more alcohols on here than normal. That's it. That's all a sugar alcohol is. Uh, deoxy sugars, you should know at least one because it's really important for DNA, right? Deoxyribose is a deoxy sugar, um, which should be on here somewhere. Let's see. That's this one right here. We just drew ribose earlier. Compare ribose to this picture right here, and they'll look almost exactly the same, except this one is deoxidized. There's one less oxygen there. So this is an example of a deoxyribose, which is another sugar derivative. Okay. Uh, sugar esters or phosphate esters, you'll learn more about, uh, for exam three material. You know the terms ATP, GTP, UTP, all that stuff, the triphosphates, right? You learned in biology that those are your uh, carriers of energy in the cell, right? Well, they, it turns out, are sugar esters. They're phosphate esters. Here's a sugar, here's a bunch of phosphates attached to them. There you go. That is what a sugar ester looks like. Don't worry about naming anything specific. Just if you're given a picture of one of these sugar derivatives, can you tell me what category of sugar derivative it is? And then you're fine. These are amino sugars or sugar amines. Well, that's pretty easy to identify, right? They look like there's, they're all sugars, but there's one functional group that turned into an amine group. That's it. I'm not going to memorize anything more from that. Uh, let's see. Uh, and see that, yeah, you don't have to worry about this because this is talked about in detail uh, for 7B, so don't worry about that. Uh, acetals and ketals, uh, whenever you saw that phrase for uh, uh, aldoses, it's basically the same thing as an acetal. Uh, stuff about ketoses is basically the same thing as ketal. I'm not going to go over it because it, it's literally the exact same definitions. Uh, oh, okay. This picture right here on the right, can you tell me if methyl alpha D glucoside has a free anomeric carbon or is, is it a free, does it have a free anomeric carbon? No. Why? Well, there's the anomeric carbon. Let's see. It's this carbon right here because it's the only carbon bonded to two oxygens. However, it is not an OH. It is, it is an OCH3. So you don't need to know the name of this thing. But if on the exam you see a picture of this and they ask you, does, uh, can it undergo mutorotation, you would say no, because there's no free anomeric carbon, right? So this is how complicated sounding things can be simplified to, does it have this or not? Yes? Yep. Uh, most of them will look like this. Uh, there used to be, and it really hasn't been uh, too common, where they draw like one in the chair conformation. Um, when, uh, when it gets closer to, well, on the exam review night, I'll know if there's gonna be anything like that. If there is, I will review chair conformation for you guys. Otherwise, this is the more likely thing that you guys will see. Is, uh, I, think, I believe they call this a Hawthorne projection or something like that, right? All right, blah, 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 okay, now, more stuff. Good, we got 10 minutes, we should be able to cover all of disaccharides. All right. Okay. For the exam, for the exam, you do not have to memorize the structures of your disaccharides, okay? However, if you're given a picture of a disaccharide, you need to be able to give its full name, which involves naming the individual monosaccharides, naming what carbon numbers form the bond between them, and saying whether it's an alpha or beta link, which we'll go over now. One of the two more common disaccharides you have to know about are lactose is lactose. Again, technically you don't have to memorize the disaccharide structure of lactose. What is more likely to happen is lactose will be drawn and you have to give the long name for, for it. So I will draw it out first for you guys. Oops. 
think I already messed up on that. Yep, I did. Excuse me. And I believe it's this. Okay. All right. Yes. Would it always be common like that? Because I remember in the past you said that even though it has been it's both connected seemingly, but would he ever go into that bend like this connected? Uh so uh it'll either be like a right angle bend like this or a curve. Either way, uh, I know what he's talking about when he says that. So so before I go into the super details of disaccharides. This bend right here that you see uh, between the two monosaccharides does not mean that there is a CH2 there. It is a little bit annoying. This bend does not mean there are CH2s there. there this is a very old way to describe uh, disaccharide connections. What this is telling you is that on the left here, on the left, this functional group is pointing up. And on the right over here, this functional group is pointing down. So that bend here doesn't mean anything. It's just a fancy way of telling you that the, the functional group on the left is pointing up and the functional group over here is pointing down. Okay. Uh, so it will most likely be drawn like this because it's easier for computers to generate pictures that look like this. Uh, but don't mistakenly think that they mean that they're CH2s there like in organic chemistry. This is the very unique situation that they're just used to indicate direction of, of bonding, whether up or down. Okay, so you don't need to know that this is lactose. You do need to be able to name it, the, the, name the individual components of it. So let's start. What monosaccharide is this? Anyone want to take a guess? It is galactose, exactly. It looks almost the exact same thing that glucose does, except this carbon right here is pointing in the wrong direction. This is galactose. Okay. The one on the right might not be as easily identifiable. Let's see. CH2OH pointing up. This functional group, because of this notation here, I just defined that this functional group, functional group right here is pointing down. So we have up, down, up, down squiggly line. What monosaccharide must this be? Glucose. Glucose is the only monosaccharide that is alternating up, down, up, down, and the anomeric carbon doesn't matter, right? So there is no OH here. That's fine. Where did the OH go? The, the OH that used to be here for glucose. The OH was used to form this glycosidic bond between the two monosaccharides. It still, this still makes this glucose. The OH did not just disappear. It was used to make the bond between these two monosaccharides. So again, how do I know it's glucose? Look at the functional groups. Pointing up, pointing down, pointing up, pointing down. That alternating pattern tells me this is glucose. All right, that's the first thing to identify is your monosaccharides. The second thing to identify is how these two things are linked together, whether they're linked via an alpha link or a beta link. And the quick way of doing that is look at the sugar on the left, because it's the first one in the naming scheme here. The sugar on the left, we look at this anomeric carbon, right? The anomeric carbon is pointing up. What about the CH2OH? It is also pointing up. Based off what you learned today, you know that what, an what anomer must that be then? It is beta anomer, which means they are linked together via a beta linkage. Okay? You wouldn't write the word beta link there. I'm just writing, down, writing it down so you guys can see that. But again, don't worry about the stuff on the right. Worry about the very first sugar that you run into because these are drawn left to right from first sugar to second sugar. This is beta linked, okay? Uh, the last thing is the numbered carbons that connect these two things to each other. So, so far we have that it is galactose, beta, blank, blank, glucose. 
there are numbers that go here that you, you kind of learn to identify in organic chemistry. I will give you a bit of a shortcut here. How do I know what numbered carbon that is and how do I know what numbered carbon that is? The trick is uh, you number your carbons in a monosaccharide starting from the most oxidized one, okay? What does the most oxidized carbon mean? Literally the one bonded to most oxygens. So this carbon is the only one in the entire structure of this monosaccharide that's bonded to two oxygens. It is carbon number one, okay? Um, and you remember in organic chemistry, you have to number all the other carbons in a nice linear pattern so that you don't skip anything. So this is carbon one, this is carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six, okay? So the first half of our answer is that the glycosidic bond between these two monosaccharides is between carbon one on galactose, as we've determined, and what about, uh, I'll ask, what carbon number is this on uh, glucose? It is carbon four, and how do we know that? Well, we start numbering at the most oxidized carbon, which is this one right here, carbon one. Then you have to go around till you cover all the carbons, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six. So therefore, on carbon number four on glucose is what connects these two things together. The reason why I go over this detail is because sometimes on the exam you'll get a disaccharide you've never heard of, nor it's not a structure you've ever seen before. So you might not get lactose, you might get something you've never seen before. However, you're still able to name these individual components, which is what it would be asking you. Identify the monosaccharides, identify whether it's an alpha or beta linkage, and identify what numbered carbons actually form that linkage, okay? Uh, we'll end for now since it's 12.49, and uh, we'll continue on Wednesday. I know I'm behind a bit. Uh, the exam review Wednesday evening will cover everything that you need, so I'm gonna go ahead and cover some lipid stuff during the exam review. All right, if anyone has any questions, I'll be up here. If anyone has a sign-in sheet, please bring it up here.